Well, James is about to enter into some pretty difficult territory. He's going to call on us to do some very difficult things. He's already talked about difficult matters, about how we treat people and favoritism and how our faith is demonstrated by our deeds. And now he's going to talk about, a little bit about how we talk, the words that we use, and what that reflects about the inside of our inner character and our inner spiritual life. This is such a relevant section of Scripture. If there is ever a relevant section of Scripture today, people are arguing so much. People are getting so upset, so angry. There's all kinds of new words that we've added to the dictionary in the last few years, just about being upset over online conversation. And yes, there are things worth getting upset over. There's, there's no doubt about that. Some things call for some upsetness, but I'm afraid that what we've experienced is some enmeshment of our emotional uh, emotions with other people to where we're only okay if we think other people agree with us or we're only okay if, uh, if other people affirm what we're saying, and if someone doesn't, then we act like they're crazy. And, you know, we need to come back to the scriptures on how we talk to each other and how we use the words that we use. And here's what James says in James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. He's saying there's all these fights and quarreling and, and it sounds like it's even worse than just verbal. Like when we think of a fight, we think of verbal. We think of words attacking and insulting. I mean, it sounds like they're actually kind of fighting each other like over stuff. And, and it, just, it just seems horrible. And he's saying that all of those actions come from somewhere. They don't just come from a vacuum. Just like Jesus talked about a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit, a bad tree doesn't bear good fruit. He says that the things, the, the fighting and the quarreling that's going on is coming from a deeper place. It's coming from covetousness. It's coming from our desires. And this is not to say we should become Buddhists who go off and, and just try to rid ourselves of all a desire and go into nirvana and complete emptiness and nothingness and transcendental meditation. He's not saying that. He's saying we need to deal with our desires. We need to convert our desires to better desires. So we kill and covet, but we don't have what we want. And the reason that we're fighting is because we don't have what we want. But who has truly what we want? It's God has truly what's most important. And maybe sometimes it actually comes upon us to evaluate our wants, to evaluate our desires and see if they actually align with the kingdom or not. And he says, but if you are going to ask God for something, instead of taking it out on other people, you really need to believe that God is the one who can truly provide you everything that you need the most. So he, he continues on here, going on this track of you got to pick one side or the other. You can't just ride the fence. He says in verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or don't you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So God is saying, James is saying, that we have to pick one side. When he says don't be a friend of the world, he's not saying don't be friendly to people in the world. He's saying don't embrace the ways and the systems and the processes and the thought processes of the way the world works. The more friendly we get with the way the world is and the evil in the world, the more we buddy up to the evil in the world, the more at odds with God we're going to find ourselves. And so he says here in verse 7 to submit ourselves then to God because God shows favoritism or favorites favor to the humble, not to the proud. God's going to stand against your pride. We kind of get into entitlement. I deserve this. I deserve that. You know, don't be boastful. Don't be prideful. God will oppose you if that's the track that you want to take. So he says, first submit yourselves to God. First submit yourselves to God. Submit yourselves to what God wants for you to have most. And the second thing he says is to resist the devil because those desires ultimately are coming from an evil place. They're coming from a place of just of, of bad um, a bad spirit, a bad heart, a bad mindset, bad thinking. So we're going to have to submit ourselves to God's way. And when we submit ourselves to God's way, we're resisting the devil. And then James tells us exactly what the devil's going to do. If you resist him, he's going to flee from you. Okay? So you are to submit, you are to resist, the devil will flee. And then, verse 8, you are able to come near to God, and he then will come near to you. You see, God has already given us Jesus Christ. While we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God made the first move, 
And now he's awaiting to see if we have faith that turns itself into action, that we should then come near to God. And if we will turn to God, if we will submit to him, if we will resist the devil, then we can come near to God, and he then will come near to us. And that is relationality. We have a relationship with God that's going to ultimately require submission and obedience and and resistance. If we're not resisting the devil and we're just going along with every little desire that comes along the way, then we are not going to be near to God. That's why we have to repent of those things, submit to God, and then draw near to him and he will draw near to us. And then he gives us just like a boom, boom, boom list of some things that we need to do. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before, before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is not to say don't ever be joyful. This is not to say don't ever laugh. He's saying that these people he's writing to are laughing over the wrong things. They're finding joy in their covetousness. They're finding joy in in taking things from people and hoarding it up for themselves. And they're laughing about it and they're finding joy in it. He's saying that's going to turn to gloom one day. If you don't want that to turn to gloom one day, you better turn that to gloom today. And then you will humble yourself before the Lord. And if you do that, Just like if you submit, resist, and come near, then God will come near to you. Humble yourself first, Tim, before the Lord, and He, God, will lift you up. This is strong language. Adulterous people, you're cheating on God by the way that you're living. Double-minded. Half a mind with with the world, half a mind with God. We're cheating on God. He is faithful, but we are unfaithful. Our friendship, again, is a love of the world, a love of the ways of the world. What's the answer? It's humility and it's submission. These two things go together. Humility is like an attitude. It's an attitude. The way we see ourselves is a humble attitude. But submission, I think, in a sense, is more of an action word. It's our choice of direction to put God in his ways first and reflect it in the way that we live our lives. So we live a humble life, and then through our through our seeing ourselves from a humble perspective, we are then able to submit ourselves to God. If we have a prideful perspective rather than a humble perspective, then we will not submit to anyone. Pride does not allow us to submit to anyone. And if you are proud, he says, God will stand opposed to you. He just said a few verses ago. And it will completely keep you from humbling yourselves so that God can lift you up. It will completely keep you from coming near to God so that God will not be able to come near to you. Or not that he's not able. God just won't because you're not showing that you have an interest in God. Now, too many people, I think, are not resisting the devil, and so the devil is just having a field day here. They're not living like the devil matters. They're not living like the devil's real, and we often knowingly engage in things that are unrighteous. We need to resist. We need to fight the devil. We need to convert our desires into holy, righteous desires, and then the devil will flee. It's time to come near to God. It's time to be purified. It's time for us to give up our double-mindedness and set our sole focus upon the Lord rather than upon friendliness with the world. And then we will have a kind of joy and then we will have a kind of laughter that will never go away because it will be based in righteousness and in relationship with God our Father. Here's what he says next in James 4, 11 and 12. Brothers and sisters, don't slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? To, he says, don't slander your brother or your sister. That, that word means to speak evilly against someone. Whether it's, made, I guess, mostly a made-up things, really. You think of made-up things are true. They're typically not true things. This goes on so, so much in Christian circles. There is so much slander that takes place. I see it all the time. And it's going to put us in too tightly with the devil's ways and friendliness with the world. And it will result in us being far from God. Let us leave the judgments to God. It's interesting that he ties slander to leaving the judgment to God because slander is largely made up. And you know, the honest reality is most of our judgments are made up. We just make up judgment against someone. We make up something and we judge them for it. We often don't know the whole story for the things that we're judging people against. Leave it up to God because God will judge with impartiality and God will judge with perfect wisdom and insight and mercy that you and I just do not possess. There are certain jobs, roles, and responsibilities that you have been given and being the judge of the world is not one of them. 
Only God is the judge, and he is the one who is the law writer and the law giver. So he is the law enforcer. You and I are not. Now, here's what he says last, James 4, 13 through 17. Now, listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go do in this, this or that in that city. Spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, he says, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you ought to boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. And if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, for them it is sin. Does this mean we shouldn't make plans? He says, don't boast about tomorrow. Don't, don't say you're going to go here and go there and do this or do that and make money and all these kinds of things. Should we not make plans? Should we not be responsible? I think we should make plans. I, I, I think we should be responsible and try to figure out a proper course of action into our future. But we're always, as we go back a few verses to... Um, uh, earlier on in the book of James, to do this in a submissive sense, to do this in a humble sense. Often people will say, well, I'm going to go do this or that, Lord willing, if the Lord wills it, if the Lord provides for it. And that, that helps us ensure that we're keeping God in the center and we're not going about in a prideful, arrogant, boastful way, saying, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to go do that, and, and with no concern for it. If God wills it, if God wants it, if God's going to help me in this. And so it's, it's okay to make a plan. But always realize that God can have different plans. And if you're not willing to submit to God's plan, then you're going to be out of alignment with God. Always consider that God has a plan and try to discern what that plan is and then make your plans accordingly. Because God can give you major course corrections and can certainly humble the, pr the proud. Our lives, he says, are fragile. They're fragile. They're just but a vapor. They're but a mist. You know, if you're in your teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, it feels like we got a long time, but we really don't know. And even another 30, 40 years, 20, 30 years really isn't all that long in the whole scheme of things. But only God knows what's going to happen next. We, we cannot predict that. And so we need to submit our plans to the Lord. We need to submit our lives to the Lord. We need to be humble people. We need to not be double-minded. We need to not slander people. And we need to not be going after people, attacking people from our covetousness, but instead appreciating the blessings that God has given to us because He is sufficient. He is sufficient. And to know these good things that we ought to do and not do them, James says, that's sin. Sometimes we think sin is just going out and doing something wrong. But James is saying it can actually be the wrong thing is to not do the right thing. Just to, to not do anything sometimes can be sin. If you know that that's the righteous thing and you avoid it and you go do something else instead, even if that's not a, you know lying, murdering, stealing, whatever, you can still be in sin because you knew the right thing, you knew your responsibility, you knew the righteous option, and you didn't opt for it. So, so I hope and pray this uh, video on the book of James chapter 4 is beneficial to you, is helpful to you in your walk. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. And we will see you next time with James chapter 5. Take care. God bless.